All right. Now, the topic I'm going to be preaching on this evening is, a, is really the subject of, of charity and how I want this church to be, and hopefully the way that you want this church to be, too. Now, I don't think we necessarily have a, a problem in this area, but I like preaching on things to maintain a focus, to maintain a direction, to, to, to keep kind of at the forefront certain things, certain aspects of, of who we are as a church and how we should be. I think we have great unity here. I think there's a lot of great friendships. I think there's, you know, um, as far as doctrine goes, I mean, as far as I know, there's, there's a great unity, and, that, and that's great, you know. Um, a lot of people are zealous for soul winning, and, and I love that too. And that's, that's obviously one of the most important things about our church. But one of the things I think we need to continually remember and think about as a church and individually is, is this concept of having charity. Now, we have to ask ourselves, because the church is not just me. I'm leading this church, but it's not just me. And the church is not going to be characterized by one person. Think about, and I know many people here have gone to other churches, you visit other churches, they all have a personality or you know, a feel to it. And the way that you get that feel, it's not just based on the sermon that you hear. It's the whole thing. You walk into a church, it goes from people greeting you or ignoring you or looking down on you or whispering about you or what, you know, all the little things that happen within church when you come inside to a church, they all have a, an impact on you. I know they did for me. And I, for a long time, I never really had a home church until Faithful Word Baptist Church. And I kind of had been in it. And that's my own problems, you know, kind of being in and out church, being a little wishy-washy in some things and just kind of getting fed up with people who wouldn't preach the Word of God and just give two verses and then a bunch of stories and, and getting a little jaded with the, whole, with the whole church scene. And to my demise, to my detriment, I, I just stopped going. But I've been to plenty of churches and they, and they had all different feels to them. So you got to ask yourself, first of all, what, what do you want this church to be? I mean, you think of, we, we just got done reading a story about Elijah, you know, and, and, and the king was asking, well, what type of man was he? He said, well, he was a hairy man. Well, if someone were to say, what type of church is Word of Truth Baptist Church? Say, hey, you visited that church before. How would you like that answer to be responded to? Are they a... Uh, proud church? Are they a holier than thou church? Are they, you know, th think about these things. Because the way that we interact with each other and people that come in, I mean, it, it makes, that makes us who we are. Our actions, what we do, the things we talk about, how, you know, how we treat one another, they all have a, an, an impact uh, not, and not just on new people. This isn't just about new people. It's about all of us. It's about everybody here. We ought to be a church that's characterized by charity. And charity, you know, can be confusing to people. But if you just remember, when you, think, when you read the word charity, and you're reading it in the Bible, understand charity comes from the root word of caring. So if you, if you remember charity, caring, it's, it's a love, it's a specific type of love that, that is concerned about other people and just their well-being and, and esteeming others better than yourself. It's that type of, it's a, it's a selfless, self-giving. And we're going to get into 1 Corinthians 13 in a little while that goes over a lot of the attributes of charity and, and you know, understand it a little bit more. But one of the things that really struck me when I went and visited another church in the Chicago area was how friendly the people were when I walked into that church. It wasn't the best, you know, I mean, doctrinally they were all right. Pretty weak on the soul winning department, but they had something. They're KJV only, right? So they had these things, but what struck me more than anything was, that, and, and this was, you know, I started going there after I moved out to Arizona. So every time I would go and visit my parents, I'd go and visit. What struck me is that I saw a lot of the same people. And every time I went in, people were asking about me and asking how I was doing. And people remembered my name. Not everybody. 
but they, they had a nickname for me. I was Arizona Dave. <laughs> right? I mean, that's, and, and you know what? That's pretty cool to go to a church that, and you go maybe once a year, you know, or a couple times a year, however often we're there. Like we usually went and visited kind of over Christmas time. So if we're there for a Sunday and a Wednesday, we would go for the three services that they had and then not see them again for like another year or whatever, you know, whatever the case may be. It's just not that frequent. But to have people come up to you, well, greet you, you know, the first time, you come up, shake your hand, and not just say hi, but ask, you know, get to know you a little bit. It goes a long way. I have a great love for that church still. Because, because of that, because of the people. And the pastor was great too. He's real warm, real welcoming. Re, you know, he, he, he uh, invited me in his office to talk to me. One, after one of the first few times, I went and visited him, and, and great guy. And that's the type of church that I think that we ought to strive to be like. We ought to be really friendly and really caring and have a charitable heart towards other people and, and willing to give of ourselves, invite people in, and treat this as a church family. Amen. Where, we, where we honestly care about it. It's not just a show. It's not just, oh, I'm supposed to say hi to somebody, so I'm going to say hi to them. Right? I mean, it, we really want this to come from the heart. We're saying, hey, someone comes in, oh, wow. This, this, is, this is ideal in my mind. Someone walks in for the first time. Hey, cool, there's someone visiting us. I wonder if this person's saved. Let, let's, I mean, they're here. We, we, we take the time to go out and knock on people's doors. You say, but how much better is it when someone actually comes here? Great opportunity. Let's welcome them and not, and not be just, you know, extremely aggressive to the point of weird uncomfortableness, right? I mean, hey, how's it going? How'd you hear about our church? How's it, you know, welcome people in and not a fake thing, right? Again, we're not, we're not just being phony. Caring about the people that come in and getting to know them a little bit. Hey, what do you, you know, what do you do for work? And, and, and look, like I said before, I don't think this is like some big problem in this church. Because I, I, love, I, I think people are doing really well. But being able to, to get to know people, and if, if someone just comes and visits us one time, at the very least, they ought to be able to say, yeah, you know what, they're pretty friendly. Friendly group. Maybe they don't believe the same doctrine as us. Maybe, that, you know, maybe they're going to leave for some other reason. But at the very least, I could say, well, yeah, you know what, though, they're a friendly group of people. Um, in Colossians 3, let's look down at the scripture now. Look at, we're going to start reading again in verse number 12. The Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy, excuse me, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering. Now, there's, you could preach on like, all of those attributes, entire sermons, bowels of mercies, just, just being extremely merciful to people. To, you know, we're not just holding things against somebody that they do you wrong. You're, you're merciful. And you're, you have bowels of mercy. You know, it's just coming out from inside of you. You're being merciful. You're being kind, treating people with respect and kindly and not being short or short-tempered or whatever, having a humbleness of mind, not thinking that you're so great. Well, I've been coming here since the start or whatever, you know, like, you know, well, whatever the case may be of you thinking that like, you know, you're kind of lifted up or I've read the Bible 20 times, who do you, you know, just a humble. Meekness and long suffering, long suffering, forbearing one another and long suffering go hand in hand. And let's face it, as a group of people, and we're still a small group, but as, as, as any group of people, there's going to be some people that you have a little bit of a, of a clash of personality with. I don't expect everybody in this church to be best friends with everybody else. I mean, it's just not realistic. And I don't think that's required in the Bible that you have to be best friends with every believer in the world or even every believer in your church. But you ought to be long-suffering and forbearing one another there are things that people do, and it's just different types of people that might get under my skin. A little irritating, right? We all have, everyone's got personality flaws, and, and you know, you just don't always mesh with everybody. 
But we need to be able to, as brothers and sisters in Christ, to just get over that, be long-suffering, be able to forbear that with each other and just say, hey, this is my brother in Christ or sister in Christ, and maybe there's some things that, yeah, I'm a little, you know, it's a little irritating, but I'm just going to overlook that. I'm going to have bowels of mercies, and we're going to get along great because we're all, you know, we're a church. We're a family. We're going to make things work. Like I said, it doesn't mean you have to be calling each other every day and making plans to go out and do stuff and hanging out together. It's a matter of getting together when we're, when we're here as a group and, and still honestly caring about each other, right? I, I don't like churches that end up, and this happens a lot, and it's part of it's because of our human sinful nature, where, where especially as churches get bigger, they start factioning off into cliques of, of people just because you're, you're just gravitating towards your friends and then you end up kind of ignoring other people. And then when new people come in and people, you know, they just kind of feel like, okay, here's a group, here's a group, here's a group. And like straight after church, people just get into their groups and start, and start hanging out. We need to be conscious of this and aware so we don't just get into that habit. And it's important because, look, I understand what it's like. Before I pastored a church, I went to a church for a long time where we had friends, where we were more friends with some people than others. And you don't necessarily see them throughout the week, so you are interested in them and you care about what they're doing, what they're up to, how has things been going, you know. I get it. But we want to, as a church, as a, as a, as a whole bigger family here, be thinking about not just your personal favorite friends, but everybody within the church. And keeping that in mind so that way no one's going to necessarily be feeling left out like, oh, I'm the black sheep of the family here, of the church family, who just no one really talks to me. No one, you know, I mean, that's, that's not right. We ought to be able to care enough about people to be able to kind of think about that and notice it and pay attention to what, other, what else is going on in, in everybody's lives. So, and again, it's a balancing thing. It, it's not, you know, it, we need to keep this in perspective be able to talk to our friends and do everything else and be forbearing of one another, being able to overlook maybe personality flaws or whatever and, and not hold that against them and still be able to, you know, you have to deal with it, but honestly, like the more you're able to show that mercy, the easier it gets. And, and the better person you're going to be overall, it's going to help you. Right. Then you won't have the the as many aggravations or irritations when you learn how to just put up with other people you start to realize you know what this is stupid anyways why am i getting irritated over nothing so verse 13 says forbearing one another forgiving one another and if any man have a quarrel against any of quarrels just a fight or an argument even as christ forgave you so also do ye this is going to keep us in unity when someone wrongs you, you're arguing with someone, you know, like these things happen. I get it. I don't, I don't expect there to never be any problems with anybody in a church ever. The more people you add, the more it's likely there's going to be problems. But, but the, 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 the key is what do you do with that? What do you do when a problem arises? Keep the mindset that Christ had. Forgive them. Be able to just put it away and just say, fine, that, you know, it may be angering, it may be, you know, maybe frustrating, but just be able to say, okay, I'm just going to forgive this person and move on because it's not worth having um, um, such a quarrel or problem within the church. Verse 14, after all those things are mentioned, look what it says, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And we're going to see this same type of verbiage being used about charity. Charity says it's the bond. What's bond? Like a glue. It's, it's holding everything. You know, it's the bond of perfectness. If we have charity characterizing our church, it's going to hold this church together. And having charity in your heart and in your life is really achieving a very high level of spirituality and your spiritual growth personally as well. Turn, if you would, to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'll just reread the, 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 the last verse I, was, I have in my notes here from Colossians 3. Colossians 3.15 says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. We're a body here. And we're all members individually, but this is one body at this local church. 
with Christ at the head. 1 Timothy 1.5 reads, Now the end of the commandment, so the commandments that we receive, God's commandment, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. That's the end result. That's the goal. You follow the commandments. You say you, you obey God. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Charity is important. Again, it's, it, this is something that we're trying to achieve is having char charity in our hearts and as a whole. Second Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, Virtue, right? You start off with faith. You get saved. You got faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Add to your faith virtue. What's virtue? Doing good. Just start doing what's right. Add to virtue knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance, being able to control yourself. You've got virtue. You've got knowledge. You're reading the Bible. And then you add temperance, being able to control what you've learned and the knowledge that you have. And to temperance, patience. Being able to deal with things, not getting discouraged, not being out of the fight, being able to endure, having that patience. And to patience, godliness. Godliness is a pretty high attribute, right? Being God-like in the sense of what, you know, the way that God wants us to be. Being Christ-like is godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Where we're kind to one another and love other people as a brother. I mean, think about, uh, hopefully you've, you've, everyone's grown up with a strong family. I don't know. Not everybody has. But in a strong family, you're going to have strong love for your siblings, right? For your parents. And, and in a functional, good family, you'll have a solid, good love where, you know what? I'll be there for my family. My brothers need me for anything. I'm there for them. Why? Because they're my brothers. Because I love them. If my parents need anything, I'm there for them. It's one of those things where it's just like, no matter what, I'm there for them because they're my family. That's the way, the same type of attitude that we need to, we need to have for our brothers and sisters in Christ to have this um, brotherly kindness towards one another. And then it says at the end of verse 7, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So after you even have that, charity. And that's it. And it's not adding more to that. It says, you know, you're adding to this, to this, and then you know, virtue to knowledge, knowledge of temperance, temperance of patience, patience godliness. The last thing is charity. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Just, just go backwards a couple, a couple pages. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse number 8. The Bible says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Hospitality, being hospitable. Caring for other people, caring for their needs. When someone needs something, you are being hospitable to them and without grudging. Not like, oh, Brother Matthew needs something again. <laughs> I guess I'll give him, you know, I guess we'll do something. I mean, I have to, right? No, that's not being charitable at all. Even if you give it to him. Turn if you want to 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to see that there. Just giving something, the act of giving something is not charity according to the Bible. That's not what that word means. People give money to charities all the time. And I think this is where part of the confusion comes in just about the word in general and what it actually means. Because it's so much deeper than just, well, tax season's coming up. If I, uh, if I give some money to a charity... I could write this off on my taxes and then the government won't get as much. At least I could give it to these people. Or, you know, whatever. Just, just giving money. Uh, I'm going to look good by doing this. Like the Bill Gates Foundation or something, right? I mean, these people have all this money. That, oh, I'm a philanthropist. Yeah, you just care about people, you know, about looking. It's your, it's your public relations fund. It's not charity. Just giving a bunch of money to people. The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians 16, 14, it says, let all your things be done with charity. Everything we do should be done with charity. 1 Corinthians 13, look at verse number 1. We're going to read through this chapter, at least through most of it, not all of it. 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1, the Bible says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. So obviously we know that there is a gift of being able to speak with other tongues in the Bible, especially in the, in the New Testament, early on there, the book of Acts. 
They were able to speak with other languages, and that was kind of a, an amazing gift to be able to, to preach the gospel to other people that you don't even know what their language is, but God's using you to be able to communicate with them. And he's saying, it, I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels. I could speak basically with any language on this earth. He says, but if I don't have charity, it doesn't matter what I'm saying, right? I'm become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Doesn't matter. It's just, it's just noise. Just, just words coming out. It doesn't even matter that I'm, that I'm speaking with another tongue if I don't have charity. Verse number two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, right? Great wisdom, great understanding, knowing prophecy, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. It's a strong statement. Imagine having the faith in God to be able to remove mountains. I mean, the Bible says it's not even that much faith right? We had faith as the grain of a mustard seed, right? We can do those things. But from our perspective, moving mountains, is like, wow, wow, you've got a lot of faith because I don't see very many people moving mountains. He says, if I don't have charity, nothing. Doesn't matter. And we saw on that list, remember, faith was the first thing and you start adding to that till you get to charity. Saying it doesn't mean anything. Look at verse 3. And this is what I was talking about. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Right? Oh, isn't there a lot of charities out there that feed the poor? That provide for the homeless, feed the poor, right? These things. I, I mean, I remember growing up and seeing it on the TV all the time. For the price of a cup of coffee, you could feed this child in Africa for, you know, for a year or whatever. Like, what, whatever that is. There's always, there's always charities like that. They call them charities. And what's he saying here? Though I bestow all of my goods to feed the poor. You could give up everything you have to feed the poor. And though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Strong statements. You could give up everything you have and give up yourself. But if you don't have the charity in your heart, truly caring about the other people, loving whoever it is that you're trying to impact here, it doesn't mean anything anything you're not gonna, it's not going to get you anywhere and now he's going to describe and define charity for us in verse number four charity suffereth long long suffering remember we saw that already this is an attribute of charity charity suffereth long and is kind kindness we saw that as well in colossians 3 charity envieth not not envying what other people have why because you're not concerned about yourself and getting things that other people have. You're not envious of what they have. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, having a lot of pride. Again, what is pride? Thinking you're better than everyone else. Charity and pride are like exact opposites. Right. When you are just lifted up in yourself and focused on yourself and everything is about me, 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 you have zero charity. Nothing. Because charity is all about everybody else but yourself. Verse number five, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Verse number six, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Loves the things of God. That's being charitable, loving God's word, not being caring about yourself, not easily provoked, you know, provoked to anger, being, being caught up into a fight because you're long-suffering. Not just thinking evil against people, not rejoicing in iniquity, hating iniquity would be proper. That would, that would be charity. Remember, we were talking about hating this morning. You're not rejoicing in iniquity, you're rejoicing in the truth. You're happy about the good things, not the wicked, not the sin, not, not the wickedness. Verse number seven, beareth all things. Bearing something, you're able to endure, you're, you're, you're able to continue on. Bearing these things. Jesus bore, bare, you know, bore his cross. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. It's never going to, if you're chari if you're charitable, you won't fail. You won't fail someone else. Just like God has the best charity and the most charity, right? When God makes a promise, he promises the eternal life, that never fails. It's sure. It's sound. He had a selfless love. Jesus Christ gave himself for others. 
out of a charitable heart because he cared about other people. It says, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Those are the other things that he mentioned earlier in the chapter. Prophecies, tongues, knowledge, right? You could have all this stuff. So you could have all that stuff, but that stuff can end. That stuff can cease. That stuff can just stop. He says, but charity, charity never stops. Charity never fails. Charity is going to continue. And that's what we need to make sure we have. Look, jump down to verse number 13, the end, of the, the end of the chapter. It says, and now abideth faith, hope, Charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Charity has an exalted position in the Bible as an attribute that we ought to have and we ought to be striving for and thinking about and pushing ourselves to be more charitable all the time, which means we're focused on other people. Turn, if you would, to 3 John chapter number 1. You go all the way to Revelation, just start going backwards from uh, Revelation, Jude, you know, you get to 3 John right away. So 3 John, there's only one chapter. A charitable church, if we are going to be charitable collectively, we're going to be caring about each other and people that come in. We're going to be a friendly church. I like this epistle of John. He's writing to one person. Not in my notes. I forget the name of the person he's writing to. Let's get there in verse number one. He says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. This is who it's dedicated to. This is who he's writing to, a man, Gaius. Jump down to verse number 13 there right at the end. He says, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust... I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee, greet the friends by name. And he's telling him, you know, about his friend. He's saying, look, the friends that are with me, we're saluting you. And he says, greet the friends by name. Now, this is an important point to remember, and I think we all ought to try to do better with this. I know I'm constantly trying to do good with this. Greeting the friends by name, remembering people's names. It means a lot. When you meet someone, when you start to get to know somebody, to remember their name. Yeah. I am not good at this and I'm continually trying to do better at this and, and keep at the forefront because I do think this is very important. If you were to look at, we don't have to look at it tonight because I don't want to necessarily take the time to go through it. Romans 16 is a great example of this. The Apostle Paul was very good at this. Romans 16, he's mentioning name after name after name, and greet this person, and greet that person, and greet this sister, and greet this fellow laborer, and greet this, you know, and he knows all of these people. Why? Because he cares about them. And in, in, in you could read many of his epistles, He's talking about praying for the people, praying for these churches, praying by name for specific people. And just, just read through Romans 16 and just think of and And some of those names were pretty hard names. <laughs> I have a hard time remembering Mike, Steve, Bob, Joe, you know, like, and he's, he's you know, Aristarchus and, and Cla Claudius and, you know, whatever, all, the, all these names in there. I, he, he did a good job. <laughs> he knew people. But one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why he was able to remember them is because he was thinking about them. Because he cared about them. Because he was charitable towards them and, and, and had genuinely cared about these people. It wasn't just a mental exercise of, let's just like, okay, I just need to remember this name. I need to remember this name. It was, hey, I wonder how so-and-so is doing. I care about that person. Greet this person. How are they doing? We ought to look at that example and, and try to employ that in our own lives. And especially when we meet people, we meet people out soul winning, someone gets saved, it's a big deal. We should care about that person. 
I mean, we care about them enough to give them the gospel. Let's care about them enough to pray for them and, and try to follow up if we can, you know. And we've gone over, I'm not going to do it tonight, the, the different things, that, the, the ways that we're going to follow up with people and, and try to feel out if they even want you to talk to them anymore or whatever. You know, we gauge that. But, but we ought to be, be not just stopping our charity at the door when we preach the gospel, but continuing on as much as we can. Caring about people. Care about the people in this church. We want to make people, when they come and visit us, don't just, uh, don't just learn their names, but try to make friends with people. Get to know them a little bit. How are you going to remember them? Make them feel welcome. Make them feel part of the church family. And we should honestly be concerned one for another. Turn, if you would, to um, Hebrews chapter 10. We looked at this verse this morning. But I want, to, I want to look at it again in a different light. Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Having friends is important, and making good friends, making good godly friends is important. If you already have friends, like Proverbs 18 says, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. If you have friends, you ought to be friendly towards your friends. Be good to them, right? I mean, do things. That's what being a friend is. You're doing things for them. And, and again, like I said, I don't think this is some big problem here. I know I've got lots of great friends. We have a small church. I have a lot of great friends in this church. I just recently had to call up on a friend to help me out, and he was there just like that. And I know that I could do that with more than one person in this room, and I appreciate that a lot. And I consider, I consider everybody my friend here. And you could remember that because if you need anything, I will be there to help you out. I will be a friend to you. And I'm not just saying that. Call me out on it or talk to anyone who ever had to. And they'll let you know I'll be there for you. Because that's the way I want everybody to be, to be there for one another because we're a family here. And I genuinely care about everyone here and those that aren't here. Hebrews 10, 24, again, you know, we mentioned this this morning about, you know, it's not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, how important church is. We ought to be able to feel, you know, it's not just, you know, we need the rebukes, right? We need to be told, right? we need the instruction from the Bible, especially when you hear the sermons, but we also need the encouragement and the edification and that love, that brotherly kindness from one another within the church to strengthen us and to help us so that we could grow even more and do greater things as a group, as a unit, collectively, together for the Lord. Look at verse number 24. And let us consider one another. Considering one another. Thinking about one another to provoke unto love and to good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. As our times get more and more evil and more and more wicked and, and things just become more and more corrupt around us, we need the fellowship, we need the unity, we need the church, we need the family here to help sustain us. Because it gets easier and easier to backslide. It's easier and easier to get into sin. It's easier and easier to stop working for God. But the more you have a good family, good people, good people to, to edify you, comfort you, rejoice with you, weep with you, it's going to keep you in the right direction moving forward that much longer. And it is vital. It is vital for the existence of any church. Turn if you would to if you would to Matthew twenty five. I'm going to read for you from First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three, verse number eight. The Bible says, "Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful." Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. We need to have, we need to all be of one mind. We all ought to have compassion for each other. We all ought to have love as brethren. Now, 
you might say, well, how am I going to, you know, I mean, this, this all sounds great, right? This all sounds great. How do we apply that? How do you apply the charity? How do you get to that goal? Well, I would start by right here. It's a good place to start. And you know what I would do? I would add the names that aren't on this list of everybody in this church and start praying for people every day. That's a good place to start because it's going to keep the people in this church at the forefront of your mind to be caring about them and thinking about them and, and just how, how is everything going? How are your troubles? How is your pain? How is your search for a job going? How, you know, what's going on in people's lives? Well, you're going to get to know that when you're praying for people and you're thinking about them. And even the things that you don't know about their life, you can still be thinking about them and praying for them. It's a great place to start. If you say, well, I kind of feel a little disconnected from our church. I don't feel like, uh, like necessarily like I'm part of this family. Start that way. And then start thinking, what else can I do? Maybe are there, are there people that, that might be thinking that I'm, that I'm snubbing them and I don't care about them? Is, there, you know, it, is it possible? And look, these things happen, and I think they happen probably the most times because people misinterpret what is being said. or what, you know, It happens so much. I see this all the time. I mean, it happens, it happens all throughout life. Someone says something, and someone takes it the wrong way, and then all of a sudden, you, you know, you start having these hurt feelings and stuff, and it's like, I don't, I, I, it'll, it'll happen. Like I said before, it'll happen because it does. But let's be conscious of that and try to um, consider one another. And, and if you even think maybe... Maybe I said or did something to somebody that could have been misconstrued. Just, you don't necessarily have to bring it up. Just do something nice or, or say something nice or have a, you know, so that there's no misunderstandings. And again, I'm not thinking about or talking about anything in particular. I don't, I don't like, like, no, oh man, you did this. Or, you know, that's not, that's not the case. I just know what happens because it happens all, it happens in my work. It happens at churches. It happens when there's, anytime you have a group of people, it happens. So let's try to, you know, keep that in mind. Think about everyone. Genuinely love them. If they're a brother or sister in Christ, you're not right with God if you're not loving your brother or sister in Christ. I mean, you, you really, you really ought to care about them. Like I said, they don't have to be your best friend. They don't have to be someone you, you, you call all the time and hang out with, but you ought to love them and care for them and pray for them. Matthew 25, I do turn there, yes? It's a passage that a lot of you know, work salvationists like to, to yank out of context, but uh, we're going to look at it tonight because it's, it's very pertinent to what we're talking about tonight. Matthew 25, look at verse, um, start reading verse number 31. The Bible says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. He shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Look at the next part. He says, For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? So this is God, this is the king, right, confronting or you know, talking to his sheep. And saying, you know what? Come on into the kingdom. You know why? Because you did, you know, you did all these good things. I was hungry and you fed me. I didn't have any clothes and you provided for me. You, know, you, you did all the, you, know, you, you cared. You had charity. You did all these great things. And they're like, when did we do that to you? <laughs> like, I, 
I don't even remember seeing you. You know, like, like Jesus Christ died on the cross 2,000 years ago. What, we don't see Jesus walk. You know, like, I didn't, you weren't in prison. I didn't come visit you. And then he says, look what he says in verse 40. And then, and the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. He knows he says, my brethren. Because we're brothers with Jesus Christ spiritually. Which is an amazing thing in and of itself. It's kind of mind-blowing that he calls us his brethren. But he says, and don't miss this, he says, in as much as you've done it to the least. Part of having the right spirit and right attitude in church is if someone's a believer. I don't care if they come in in, in raggedy clothes or they are a little quirky, a little weird maybe for what you're used to, not very cool very nerdy, whatever, whatever the case may be, they, they might be the least out in the world. We ought to esteem them just as much as anybody else Amen. and take care of them just like anybody else. And when they're in need, when they need clothing and they need food, we help them out, we feed them because if we're doing it to them, it's just like doing it to Christ. And that is the proper attitude to have. That is the way that we need to be viewing our brothers and sisters in Christ and, and, and being charitable, hospitable, and, and kind with brotherly kindness and affections. That is how we are going to succeed as a church and do get all the work done that we really want to get done. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. We're almost done. Philippians 2, and we'll go back to 3rd John. When I saw the reference to 3rd John, I, I, was, I was lining it up because I, because I have this other reference here that, that I put in later. Um, but we'll get there in a minute. Philippians chapter number 2. I'm just kind of chuckling to myself because I, I had what I, want, what I wanted to say earlier is, is on my last page of notes. So Philippians chapter number 2. Verse number one. Great, great chapter. I mean, Philippians 2, you talk about how our spirit ought to be in, in the charitable spirit. Philippians, the whole book was really geared towards this, in, in chapter 2 especially. Look at verse number one. The Bible says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus." This is, the, this is the bond of perfection. We want our church to be sealed with the bond of perfectness. With that bond of charity and having that attitude of humility and esteeming others better than yourself where, where I'm willing to let my stuff go. I'm willing to put my stuff to the side. All the things that I'm focused on, I'm worried about in my life to help other people out. So I could make you succeed. This is a charitable heart and spirit that we need to have. It's the same mind that Christ had. He came to this earth, took on the form of a servant. He put aside his kingship. He put aside his royalty, his esteem. He put it all aside and was born in a meager environment, humbly of a virgin, and lived a life of perfection, but lived a life for others and not for himself in any way, shape, or form. Everything he did revolved around helping other people out. Preaching, healing, dying, everything. He endured shame. He endured, he endured everything. Why? Out of love. He laid down his life 
for us. Greater, greater love no, hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. That's a great act of charity. It's out of love. Now let's turn back to 3 John there, right, right uh, near the end of the Bible. We're just there. Close with this. 3 John. As I already mentioned, this is written under a particular person, Gaius, well-beloved, from the Apostle John. Verse number 3. The Bible reads, For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth. So the Apostle John hears about Gaius. He's hearing a report from other people. He's not there with them. He's writing them this letter now. And he's saying, wow, you know, I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came, when my brothers in Christ came and they testified of the truth that is in there. They, they told me about what you're doing. They told, you, told me how you're walking in the truth. Verse number four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. He got this guy saved, Gaius. He discipled him a little bit. He kind of led him on the right way and then he had to take off. And then he hears back, how's Gaius doing? And they report saying, yeah, Gaius is walking in truth. He's doing what's right, man. He's, he's, he's going forward. He's doing a good job. And he's saying, you know what? I have no greater joy than to hear that, that my children walk in truth. Verse number five, beloved. And beloved is Gaius. That's who he's talking to. He's referring to him as beloved. I love, you know, he's, he's endearing him. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey, journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. And then he goes on and on in the letter, but he's saying you're doing faithfully. Just He's dependable. He's faithful. He's doing faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. So he's saying not, he's not just helping out the brethren, but he's also be doing good on the, on the strangers and that his charity, his kindness, his forwardness, his walking in the truth is known unto, unto the whole church. I mean, people know hey, Gaius is, he's solid. He's faithful. He loves people. He's there to help. He is there a worker. You know, you might be wondering, and, and I preach on many times, on, on, you know, the will of God and your life and being members and finding your talents and finding your gifts and trying to figure out how can God use me? You know, maybe you're not going to be a pastor. Maybe, you know, whatever. There's all these different things. How about being charitable and being very helpful and just, just helping people out? Right. That is a very important job to have. That's right. That's Caring about other people, thinking about other people, praying for other people, being faithful, walking in truth, and just having that report that, wow, Sister so-and-so, brother so-and-so, they are always there to help. Amen. And being a Gaius, being a well-beloved Gaius. How about that? That's an important role in a church. It's a role we all should have, but that's something that I don't think you necessarily have to be particularly gifted for. You just have to put forth an effort and be conscious and be thinking about that. Let's think about these things. Let's be these things. Let's be this type of church. I think we have a great church. Again, I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone in our church. I think, I think we're doing a good job, but I want to do better. I want to have this in the forefront and be mindful. I don't want people, I don't want people leaving our church. I mean, if they, if they leave, they leave. You know, but I don't want it to be because we are not kind, because we're not doing our jobs, because we're not being friendly, because we are not trying to help people. I do not want it to be for those reasons. People leave for doctrine, they leave for doctrine. People leave for other reasons, people get into sin or whatever, you know, those things happen. But not only that, I don't want our members, to, I mean, just because people aren't leaving doesn't mean we're not lacking. I don't want our members feeling like I'm not part of this family, no one really cares about me. Look, we ought, we ought to be doing enough of a job to make sure that everybody realizes that we're, we're family and we've got charity. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, 
all the instruction you give us. Lord, we thank you for leading the example for us and giving us, loving us so much. Tremendous amount of love, dear Lord. Help us to, to add to our faith, to add to, our, um, to everything the, the charity, dear Lord. Help us to, to achieve that end, the end of the commandment, dear Lord, to have a charity out of a pure heart and not, not be grudging and not, be, um, not have any other flaws, dear Lord, but that we can truly and honestly care about the success of other people and esteem others better than ourselves, dear Lord. I pray that you please help our church to, uh, to grow and to excel in, in that type of uh, brotherly kindness and charity and love, dear Lord, and that you would just help us to continue to, to lead the, by example of, of, um, that you left for us the, in the way that Jesus Christ lived and walked, dear Lord. We, we know we're not perfect, but God, help us to, um, to push forward and, and to really care about others and let that care be known. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.